You know, this is an amazing scene. You can hear the bells 10 to 6 on a Thursday evening. Everybody's leaving the city. Uh, this is what I did for many years. The real grind, the real hustle, working for, you know, an institutional type shop. You know, you come in and you work all day and, and you leave no better off. But uh, when I look at this and I realize how many people have yet to really understand crypto and blockchain, it uh, fills me with excitement that nothing stays the same. Everything's always changing. We're really going to be there for the turns. Uh, we are on our way down to a private discussion, roundtable presentation with regards to blockchain in 2019 and how it's affecting lots of different industries. I believe I'll be talking more about blockchain within the financial industry and, uh, and how, we see, how we see the world. So uh, yeah, another great win for City of London, blockchain capital of the world. Um, some really interesting people are gonna be down there tonight as well, FCA, Bank of England, HSBC, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, lots of different hedge funds, family offices. So I think it's a real showcase for SVK to really kind of communicate um, how and what and why we do what we do. What do you think, Joss? Listen, our policy is to say yes to everything that we do. This is the second or third night out this week, right? And it's now Thursday. We say yes to everything because we want to be everywhere. We want to be a voice within the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. And as you mentioned, this is an exclusive event. So I think it's really important that we're there giving our two cents and our thoughts on how we see this future and how we see this powerful technology that is blockchain in particular, the EOS IO protocol developing. And what it's going to mean for these people who are looking to find out more, right? They're looking for an edge and we're there to educate and we're there to try and give them our view and our vision of how this is going to look in the next five to ten years. I think it's awesome that you have a real, a real experienced crowd, uh, real professionals within their own fields. Like when you look at a lot of the uh, financial institutions that are all looking to see how they can adopt blockchain, um, it's, it's wonderfully insightful um, and it's a great opportunity for us um, to be working with the smartest minds in their industries and uh, we are all about our home turf advantage in London and we intend to nail that, like nail it to the ground. Yeah. So uh, tonight is uh, one of our rollouts for that and uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a great evening. Hayes are one of the leading headhunters and recruitment consultants in the area. They do a lot of advisory work as well when building out teams. So I think Hayes, uh, which are the event organizer tonight, are having a real select crowd down to their office. So wonderfully privileged to be asked down to do that. And the guys over there have actually been part of our community, the guys from Hayes. And uh, it was on the back of them coming down to lots of our events that yeah. they thought that it motivated them to, uh, to do one of their own, which is great to this see. This is great to the see, The ripple man. effect. <laughs> <laughs> is that Ripple Labs or no, Ripple XRP? None. Neither. Neither. Man, when you throw a big rock into a pond, you see the ripples take place. It's just wonderful to see other people, you know, starting to pioneer the community-driven approach that we have here at SVK. Uh, it's wonderful to see other people organize meetups so we can go to rather than actually put on. Uh, it's wonderful to be asked to be speaking at these events. And listen, it's just the start, man. We are really, really, really at the inception point. And um, I think that's wonderfully exciting as well. If the market needs to mature and there more, needs to be more regulation and there needs to be more of an accredited investor and there needs to be more structure to it, I, agree. I don't necessarily I agree. think that's a bad I, thing. I agree. I'm just saying that the days where anyone and everyone had the ability to enter into an ICO, which was something very special, has changed, yeah. right? And as you said, whether that's for the better or worse, you know, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with that, but that was something kind of special. I and mean, it was the first of its type, crowdfunding 2.0. Like it was something very special, the ability to own a token in a project. Yeah, it had a white paper or nothing else, but everyone had the ability to get it, right? And that was something that still is very special. Yeah, I, listen, I think I've got nothing but... Uh, Fond memories. <laughs> dis distant <laughs> memories. <laughs> I've 
we've just had this thought, right? So where are we, right? We're right at the start of something that's so amazing, right? So nascent, right? People haven't really figured out where we're going and how we're going to yep. get there. Yeah. But actually, that's not a weakness, that's a strength. Because it's so early, we have the willingness for everybody to help out. Like, I look at you. you. You are the most active person who helps our community each and every day. You're like Mother <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but it's true. Everybody's willing to help out because everyone wants to get ahead. And I'm not mean ahead in like you versus me. I mean ahead when it looks at fiat, ahead when it looks at old tech, ahead when it looks at centralized systems, right? We're building this, this gang, this community, this network and everybody's invited to help everybody else, and I really feel that. It's a pure form of transaction. You have something that I don't have, and I have something that you don't have, so together we can make something special, right? And it doesn't mean that we're always going to be working together, but if I can help you, I will, and if you can help me, you will, because we're better together from that, right? Oh, amen. And instead of, instead of closing in, which is what's been happening a little bit in the crypto yeah. space, especially with the current price and the, where the market currently is, people are a little bit drawn in. And I think this is the time to expand I've, more and help as much as you can. I've noticed that. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would just really like to thank Hayes for inviting me to speak here this evening. Um, it's a real privilege um, to be asked to speak anywhere, let alone our home turf of London. Um, thank you all very much for your time this evening as well. I'm sure you all have very busy lives. Um, it's amazing to see uh, the influx of, of the professional uh, people in the room into this space. Um, it's something that I've been involved in since about 2016. Uh, with regards to buying my first Bitcoin. And it's lovely to see how the space has matured, but we still have at the core of that business, really the community and people wanting to learn to make a better world. So in this presentation, um, I talk a little bit about what we do at SVK Crypto, uh, what our vision is. Blockchain will positively disrupt global industries and fundamentally change the way we view value and trust. This is really core to what we believe. The disruption that we've started to see within businesses is absolutely breathtaking. Recently, if you're aware of the scandal at Facebook, we had Cambridge Analytica, which were taking your data and selling it on. Um, initially, when we all signed up for something like a Facebook, um, it was a great platform for us to use to keep in contact with our friends, to have as a messenger. Little did we know that 10 years later, the data from everything that we do, when we look at it, what we like, how we like, what we post, was being scraped and sold. And when we look at the technology of the future, it's not acceptable to do that. And all the smartest guys in the room that I know that worked at Facebook and Google and Amazon have now started to migrate across onto working on blockchain technology projects. Why? Because data should be ours. It should be owned by us. And if we decide to give it up, we should be remunerated or told about it. So there is a massive shift in how the young people are viewing some, something as simple but yet important as data. And remember, having something as value and trust with the ability of our first investment into Bitcoin, it allowed peer-to-peer -peer transactions. It challenged the way we view money. And when you look back at the history of money, we used to use shark's teeth, then it was stones, then it was pieces of metal, then it was coins, and then it was paper money. Technology has changed so much that we're not in a situation where we have to have a piece of paper with 10 pounds on it that you deem to have as value and I deem to have as value. Technology is changing that. It's out of the box. It never goes back. The way that we have value and trust will change rapidly. A little bit about myself. Uh, I am the co-founder of SVK Crypto. Uh, we set up SVK Crypto in approximately 2016. Um, that's not my background. I had a very serious background in the city for many years. I've actually worked as a portfolio manager for one of the largest hedge funds here in London. That hedge fund was called Bluecrest Capital Management. I was a PM running their equity capital markets business. We managed in total about $35 billion and we're probably the most aggressive shop in the world with regards to performance. Um, I was also, in 2007, made the youngest managing partner of the firm's history at 31 years old. 
I was made the youngest managing partner of the firm's history, not because of the school that I went to or who I knew. It was the ability to spot opportunity and act on it quicker than anybody else, manage risk, risk and execute. That opportunity that I saw back in 2007 with regards to the equity capital markets, that opportunity that I saw back in the late 90s with regards to the technology space, that opportunity is now tenfold to what I'm seeing in the blockchain space today. Remember, the price action that we've seen in the cryptocurrency markets, it's not important. Price is driven by fear and greed. It's driven by emotion, speculative. And certainly when you don't have the ability to have earnings, as Troy said, you don't have revenues, you just have an idea, it's difficult to model. But you're looking at the wrong thing. You have to look at the tech build out. You have to look at the protocols, the plumbing, the piping. What are they going to be used for and how they're going to be used? And that's what really excites us at SVK Crypto. I wanted to learn everything. Um, I have an ability uh, and a passion uh, that becomes almost at a point of unhealthiness that when I see something, I want to know everything. I want to know what that investment has had for breakfast, dinner. I want to know where they live. I want to know who they speak to. What do they do? How they work? What have they done? I want to own the space to a point of obsession. And I got onto Amazon back in 2016 and tried to order every book about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. I think there was four books. It didn't take me very long. <laughs> I bought every book and I read it. Um, and. Uh, one of the guys in the office had said, hey, there's a meetup going on. I think this was about January 2017. There's a meetup going on. And I was like, oh, that sounds really great. A meetup about one. They were like, well, about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. And I said, OK, that's great. What investment bank, hedge fund, private equity shop is putting it on? What hotel are we going to have a lunch in? Looking back at my days of, of, of working for a tier one hedge fund. And I was told that it was in neither of those places. It was in a basement flat in Shoreditch just off Hoxton Square. And there was going to be free beer, house music, and um, 25 people all talking about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. I said, hey, sounds exactly like my type of place. Uh, when I went down there that night, um, it was my first meetup and my first exposure to the community. Uh, there was a sheet against the wall. There was a projector. And um, there was a lot of interesting characters. Um, some people with long hair, um, some people with Bitcoin tattoos. Nobody as smartly dressed as you find people here tonight. But what there was there was the, the ability to share and communicate, the ability to help, the ability for a better vision. And even if I may say a little bit of a libertarian type vibe to it, but I'm kind of cool with that. It was on that night that somebody told me about something that I couldn't even pronounce, let alone spell, called Ethereum. And how it had a smart contract on how it was programmable money, how it was, they had the ability to have rules, code as law. It was at that stage where everything became unlocked and clear. It was at that stage when I looked at a Harvard Business Review about the initial coin offerings, ICOs, which was so similar to my background at Bluecrest, where I managed their global IPO book. But when I looked at this amazing new asset class, it didn't have a prospectus. It wasn't signed off by the legal team. It didn't have Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, or Deutsche Bank on the book. It had a white paper and a glossy website and you were on your own. That was pretty scary to get your head around, especially when you're trying to work out evaluation metrics on it. But at the start of 2017, the total market capitalization of all cryptocurrency and blockchain technology was $20 billion. By year end, 31st of December 2017, the market, total market capitalization of all cryptocurrency and blockchain technology was $800 billion. That's a 40x return, if my maths is about correct. At the start of the year, when I rang all my hedge fund buddies that would literally bet on two flies on a wall, they all said I was crazy. They all said I was mad. And they said that the only thing that you could buy with Bitcoin was illicit, illicit substances online. I said, well, at least it's got a market. It's better than the two flies on the wall. By the end of 2017, every one of those guys was ringing me back wanting to know how they could get in. Of course, I didn't take any money off anybody. I had no interest in managing capital. I think, as Troy said, I'm not an expert. They're not an expert. Nobody's an expert. I was really trying to understand the market dynamics. In 2017, I didn't want to take anybody's capital. We had enough proprietary capital. We were happy to make mistakes. And I always say this, that 
if these markets, they're binary. And if these markets were to go to zero tomorrow and I had lost all the initial money that I'd put in, I'm fine with that. I'm absolutely cool. But what happens if it doesn't? What happens if it goes to 10 trillion, 20 trillion, 100 trillion, and you bought something of the internet? You bought something of a Google or an Amazon? Are you made a difference? The legacy view for me is what it's all about. The money, I don't really care. So much so that we turned down investment from everybody who wanted to invest into us because we were really finding our way. We were really trying to figure out how this new nascent market was developing. You know, what was it? How was it going to evolve? So where are we now? Well, when you look at the, the market capitalization as a number, we have gone from that 800 billion all the way down to, I think it was about $135 billion today. Um, I think the markets will remain volatile. Um, I think that we've seen a lot of retail participation in, in the market at some stage. I know Mike Novogratz from Galaxy Digital, ex-Fortress Goldman Sachs, was talking about something in the region of 97% of market participants were retail. Sounds like a lot of fun, but it scares me as well. We've had lack of institutional involvement, although every institution is trying to find ways to get in. I think Troy had mentioned several of the investment banks um, that have been, been uh, trying to get where they're angling, angling in. For me, with the market capitalization of $135 billion, it's just an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity because you've already had somewhat of a proof of concept. We've had the roads and the rail, the tunnels and the pipes all being built out. Um, we have had adoption, albeit on a very small scale, but each and every day that cryptocurrency and blockchain technology survives, it's becoming stronger and stronger and stronger, and more people get to know about it. But it wasn't always like that, and somewhat still not. I still think that we're probably in the year of 1994, 1995. When I relate back to where we are right now, to the internet. And we all use the internet each and every day. You take out your phone, you hit a button. If you don't connect to the internet within three seconds, you get upset, you get annoyed. It wasn't always like that. There was a time when I had a gateway computer, and it was stuck in the corner of uh, our living room. And um, an AOL CD would come in, and you'd take out the CD, and you'd turn over the back, and it had a 24-digit code. And you go over to the computer, and you get the CD, and you put the CD in, and you push it in. And it comes up, and you put in the code, and then you run. And you connect it to the modem, and your mother would pick up the phone wondering, oh, what the hell are you doing? Your dad would ask you, how much is it going to cost? And eventually, you get through to this thing called the internet. What did you do? What was it for? Is the internet superhighway? The first killer application for the internet was email. And that's what brought us all to the terminal. When we were on the terminal, well, then we would look at weather, sport, news, and we became addicted. And that killer application for blockchain hasn't occurred, not necessarily yet. Uh, we're brought in to talk to uh, a lot of different enterprises which are looking to adopt blockchain. Um, people in ticket sales, uh, loyalty programs, uh, air miles. Um, and like back in 1994, 1995, it was like, what's your internet strategy? And now I feel that there's more pressure on CEOs saying, well, what's your blockchain strategy? And it's wonderful to see the larger institutions and enterprises looking at the space because they've got the dollars, they've got the foresight, and they will really help drive adoption because they already have users or clients or members. So it's, it's an education that we're all on. And I think it's important that we all try to play our part. Because I remember seeing a, a recent thing about Jeff Bezos when he went to raise his first five million for Amazon. He said he did uh, something in the region of 60 meetings. He raised a uh, million dollars of approximately 40 to 60,000 from each of those investors. He valued Amazon at that time at five million dollars. It's hard to believe. Every, every, every meeting he had, the first thing that people said to him was, so what is this thing called the internet? Every meeting I go in, it's what is this thing called the blockchain? So it's interesting, similar. As I said, market cap, uh, $135 billion. Uh, for me, it's totally irrelevant. Um, we are investing into companies and taking equity stakes like traditional VCs. Um, what I've noticed in the last uh, 
two weeks. Um, the market has been somewhat range bound in between kind of 105 to 110. Uh, we've started to see lack of negative sentiment, lack of negative news. We've started to see more positive sentiment. We've started to see technical setup, although I'm a little bit skeptical in a market that just doesn't have all the data. Um, but what we are seeing is the tech build out at a rapid rate. And when you look back when the market was last at $135 billion and where it is right now, the tech is tenfold bigger than, than what it was. There is some catalysts in the near future, um, but the market is the market and it's driven, as I said, by fear and greed. We don't have revenues, we don't have DCFs, we don't have PEs. Um, but uh, for, for me, the writing's on the wall. Um, I take a 10 to 20 year view on the space. It's just, um, it's extremely compelling, I should say. It's not financial advice, by the way. I'm not telling anyone to buy anything. You do whatever you want to do, but um, I know how I'm positioned. So um, opportunity, um, I think it's one real big opportunity. Um, just, just like uh, the early days of, of the internet, um, technology never goes back in the box. We've seen a lot of capital deployed into the space. And we've started to see the likes of uh, IBM work with, with Stella. We've started to see the likes of uh, Consensus now working with, well, Ethereum because they're back with it. Uh, we've seen some really big players move into the space, both on the custody side side with Fidelity. We look, talked about JP Morgan with the JP Morgan coin. Um, we've looked at uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with a futures um, option on Bitcoin. These are all very interesting in their own right and all very small, but it's the combination of all where you're starting to see the validation and the adoption. The market outlook. Um, when I look at uh, what we're seeing, um, the first thing that I've really looked at at the market is not necessarily the participants, but the brain drain of who's actually joining the market. Um, it's amazing to see just how many people that I've spoke to in the last three to six months coming out of financial institutions. Uh, a lot of bankers that I've also seen. Um, I've seen uh, a lot of funding coming in from, from the government. Um, we've started to see uh, you know, more and more conferences around the world. Uh, we've started to see uh, you know, more and more talk about uh, you know, market dynamics and institutional you know, money flow and involvement. And for that, there is some challenges that we'll get onto and talk about. Institutional barriers to entry. Um, I think this is an interesting one because I come at it from an institutional background. When we really look at cryptocurrency and blockchain technology right now, it's an unregulated framework, and we at SVK Crypto are very, are very pro-regulation. We think regulation allows you to act within certain boundaries which are clear and positive. It's a rule book. Um, obviously, uh, with regards to cryptocurrency being 24-7, uh, 365 globally, you have a lot of different regulators around the world, and each of them regulate differently. I think the FCA have done a great job. Uh, they've been very active. Uh, they've been very approachable. They have a sandbox where by I know that there's a lot of companies. Uh, they've been very helpful with regards to their inquiries. I think when the market goes from 20 billion to 800 billion, it catches everybody off. And I think um, the regulators have done a really good job to really try to understand. Remember, regulation is there for it to be, to be fair and really to uh, help um, you know, more retail type clients and also to keep a you know, big stick on, on the larger institutions. But the FCA have done a great job and I think it's, it's really a credit to the, the UK and, and London blockchain. Of course, um, if you are a financial institution and you decide to have exposure in digital assets, as they're now being called by a lot of financial institutions, you need to have custody. Uh, when we look at what's happened recently, um, just some stuff on the institutional side, uh, payments, we've seen Circle, which is an on-ramp from fiat to crypto, of course, being acquired by, by Goldman's. A settlement, we've seen JP Morgan with the JP Morgan coin, which really is a kind of a walled garden, the ability for, for, for people to use the JP Morgan coin to settle trades internally. Um, a lot of people were, were quite negative about it. Um, I think it's all good news, and I welcome, I welcome JP Morgan, which is a powerhouse, and uh, I think it's great that they've got the foresight. I presume now that JP Morgan have done it. Um, investment banks being investment banks, I think there'll be a lot of people, a lot of people copying that. But, um, Anyway, I think it's all positive. And then custody uh, solutions, there's been you know, several different 
high level institutional grade custody solutions fidelity have have entered the field there was a really great article in bloomberg uh, there is a london journalist called alistair marsh who's in our community uh, who looks after all the crypto assets here at bloomberg and he's been writing some really encouraging pieces and he broke the fidelity story so um it's great to see the powerhouses moving into that because it could be a huge business for them but it's still hard to connect it's still difficult for individuals like us to buy crypto even someone with um, you know, moderate experience in the space, I still have to check and double check private keys, different, different types of uh, crypto that I'm sending to different exchanges. Um, you really have to be on your game to make sure that you're sending the right amount at the right time to the right exchange. Okay, uh, where are we going? Um, I believe that uh, we are going to start to see uh, more tech being built out. Um, I think we're going to start to see uh, dApps, dApps actually have some type of user case. Um, I think it's going to be uh, maybe even seamless where you don't even see that you're using a dApp or a blockchain. To be honest with you, a lot of people don't really care if they're on Wi-Fi or G3 or G4. Um, I think we've probably seen the end of the bear market, but um, anything is possible in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. I think we're going to start to see you know, more regulation come into this space. Um, I think what we saw with regards to the ICO market back in 2017, I think those days are probably a little bit behind us. Uh, I think we're going to see an evolution into security tokens. I think that's, that's good because they have, um, they have uh, elected professionals, uh, they have institutional type great offerings, they're backed by either a commodity, an equity, cash or an asset. Um, they're on exchanges which are regulated. So I think that's, that's an interesting trend to see how the tokenization of everything will, will come about. Um, I think really one thing that we have to see is mass adoption. Um, it's wonderful to build an operating system, but if you don't have anybody using the operating system or you don't have any programs built on it, well, then it's just an operating system. It's, for me, a little bit pointless. Um, <coughs> What we need to have with regards to mass adoption is obviously a responsive user experience, the ability to scale with demand. And I think scaling has been somewhat um, challenging. Um, when you look at some of the uh, issues currently with Ethereum, it's been difficult on the scaling side. It was a wonderful crowdsourcing platform with the ERC-20 tokens. Um, but the ability to scale and, and, and do transactions, uh, you have to be able to do you know, not just one transaction a second, not just 15,000 transactions a second, but MasterCard on, on any given day can do up to 22,000 transactions a second normally. At peak times around Christmas, there's about 40,000 transactions per second. When we look at the blockchains of the future, we're going to have to see a multiple of that. It's going to have to be frictionless experience for users. Um, I think what you just saw there with regards to the internet, it's still very clunky. Um, it has to be totally smooth. Like we connect to Google now, we push a button and we're on. And we have to be extracted away from blockchain that maybe we don't even know that we're using a blockchain. Uh, investment themes, um, I just wanted to kind of point out a few things that we're looking at in-house, which we think are quite interesting right now. Uh, social media, I kind of touched on that with, with Facebook. Um, we know that there's one or two large uh, social media platforms being built out right now where you own your own data. Uh, there will be a token embedded into the social media. Uh, the more participation you have within that ecosystem, you get remunerated in that token. And if at any stage you want to disclose your data for whatever reason, you get remunerated. It's like an incentive layer. Uh, you also, as a member of that social media network, uh, you own the network. This is not like Facebook, whereby in Palo Alto, they have a room four times the size of this with servers where only 20 people are allowed into. We're talking about open source, whereby millions of people can add to the code. Millions of people can add to the project. Millions of people can help shape and direct, not just 20 people that are locked in a room. Those times, I think, are coming closely to an end. Supply chains, uh, we talked about farm to fork earlier on. Uh, we've been talking to several different supermarkets in the UK that are looking to have authenticity from where that was actually picked up out of the ground to how it got onto your plate. I think blockchain is a, is a really good use case for supply chains. Um, we have gaming. Um, gaming, and I'm not talking about gambling, I'm talking about gaming, game playing, uh, Second Life, Fortnite, um, whichever game you like to play. Gaming has become mobile because it's become accessible. Uh, it's become, uh, uh, and has been for quite some time, 
um, the ability to have avatars and in-gaming economies whereby people value um, their sword or they value that pot of gold. Um, and who is it for us to say it has value or not? The gamers were the first people to really understand digital assets. Uh, mining for gold was actually quite big back in the very early 2000s. But gaming and with the gamers that are out there, um, it's become such a growing industry. In fact, a lot of the kids now like to actually look at people playing games. It sounds unusual, but some of, some of the big game players like Ninja can attract up to like 30 to 40 million people when they go live on YouTube to see how they're playing games. Um, that to me is extremely interesting because it's attention. Uh, usually business goes where attention is. With regards to non-fungible tokens, when you had games and you had gold in a game or you had a high score or you had an avatar or a shield, it was owned by the people that owned the game and at any time they could, take, they could take that back from you. With non-fungible tokens, you actually own that asset. It's a digital asset on the blockchain and you can go into numerous different games and own that asset. It has value. There is only one of them or a finite supply for the one that you have. That's pretty interesting because with non-fungible tokens, you can then put that onto other things like maybe different types of digital art or, digi or using that to have a digital token of something that has value. Uh, data management, well, I think that's, you know, that's, that's pretty obvious. We're starting to see, we're starting to see uh, blockchain really help out the data management side. And uh, security token infrastructure, um, STOs, I think this is going to be a really big theme this year, um, whereby we'll have the tokenization of everything. It has liquidity and it allows people to have fractional ownership. Um, the future, um, for me, uh, I feel immensely privileged uh, to have stumbled on Bitcoin. I feel immensely privileged to be brought into the community. Uh, I feel immensely privileged to be here with you all this evening. But we're only at the start. I mean, this thing hasn't even started to get going. And I don't know when it will. Market timing is not something that you can pick or predict. But I know when it does, I'll be right there with my crew of people, with my community, looking at how we can help, support, and grow, and also generate returns for our fund. Um, apart from that, we have a lot of fun doing it. And uh, yeah, I hope you uh, enjoyed the next 10 to 20 years. Strap in, enjoy the ride. Okay, so that was the most enjoyable night I've had in a long time. We're here at Hayes, which is one of the largest recruitment consultants and advisors into the tech space in London financial area. Um, I spoke uh, for quite some time really about the passion, about what we do at SVK and how we do it and how we view the markets. Uh, Charles, you were sitting in the audience. How I did was. you find it? I thought it was a great expo of okay. uh, your speaking ability. I think you did really well. I think it was really impactful, meaningful, but most importantly, why we do what we do. Why do we do these events? Why do we get up in the morning? Why are we passionate? Why are we high energy? Why? Why? What does um, this all mean as well? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'm going to answer that. It's because we why? believe, right? And when you believe, you do each and everything 100% to your ability and you don't stop persistence, persistence, persistence because you believe in something. Damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> and today was actually really nice. We had two other panelist speakers who spoke so well and they went into real in-depth knowledge with regards to blockchain and then also how it affected the supply chain. I think the value add really came uh, for all Hayes's clients that were here and it's just great. It's a privilege and we love doing this. London is our home turf. London is the blockchain capital of the world and SVK sits right here, right in the middle, bringing everybody together. Community is power.